Thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Uh, my name is Abdi Latif. I'm the East Africa correspondent for the New York Times. And uh, with us is Manjira Madai. Um, welcome. Thank you. Karibu Thank from you. Kenya, uh, who is the managing director in the African Global Partnerships uh, for the World Resources Institute. Um, we're just going to get straight into it, and I'll open up for questions uh, later in the session. But, Wanjira, this is your fifth um, COP. What, how is it different for you? What are some of the burning questions that were in your mind when you were on the flight uh, coming here? Thanks, Abdi. Pleasure to be in discussion with you and to be back at the New York Times Hub. Um, I have to say, when I was coming this time, I was, I was trying to be appreciative. I was trying to say what's, what's good, because I had just done some interviews where I was expressing anxiety around outcomes, because there was so much made of the fact that this is an African COP, this is about implementation and action, and what does that really look like? And I, I, I just, and even today, just feel like we're still sort of talking, where is the implementation, where is the action? But looking back, it is true that on loss and damage, we didn't even talk about it. It was not an issue to be discussed. It was completely no-go. And today, it's on the agenda. A real, honestly, a real celebration there. So I re I, that, I must say, was front of mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, your work with... Um, um with the World Resources Institute. Um, could you just like introduce uh, the audience a little bit to that and just uh, some of the work that you do in all the countries that you work in? Yeah. So WRI, as we call ourselves, the World Resources Institute, is a research organization. We say we are research, but we use research for action. So we count it, that's the research. We change it, we use that research for action. Then we scale it, because of course you can't have change without scale. And we have three key human systems that we're working on. Energy, um, cities, we believe that cities are really where a lot of the change will happen, and then, of course, around food, land, and water. You want me to use the microphone? Like, my booming voice is not enough. <laughs> so, uh, and food, land, and water. And so those are the three systems. But in addition to that, acknowledging that there are some enabling or... Um, S systems that enable or hamper progress, and those are in finance, in governance, and in economics. And so looking at those systems architecturally, what are the things that need to change to hasten uh, progress? And so we work across, you know, we have 2,000 staff across five different regions and uh, in Africa in five countries where we are deepening our work uh, today. Great. Um, you're also involved with the Green Belt Movement, which uh, is the organization that was created by your mother, the late Wangari Madai, who's also won the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and I was reading, I was rereading her book on, on my flight here, and one of the interesting things that stood out for me was that how she recognized early on, both in her life and in her career, uh, the interconnectedness of deforestation, poverty, food insecurity, and disenfranchisement. And I was just wondering how uh, her life and her work, which you're now continuing, has also uh, impacted your own thinking and also influenced your own philosophy. That's a great question. Actually, my mother was a great influence in my life because I spent the last probably 10 years of her life working directly with her. And whereas I knew, I knew what my mother did, of course, when I was younger and I, and I was, but I, also, I always assumed that's what people do. Everybody's mother does something, they're working hard, whether they're at home or they're working in the office, and my mother just happened to be working, doing what she did. But only later, when I worked with her, did I appreciate the, the, the genius of that, uh, what you said, the interconnectedness of everything. She really believed that the environment was the most important thing. She told me that all the time. And she said she was horrified that the budget lines, every time the president read the budget, she would be horrified that the budget for environment was so low. And she genuinely would say, you know, if the environment is not there, we are dead. If it was any of these other ministries, we could carry on, but you need the environment. It is our life support system. And so that was very much a part of my 
my daily <laughs> upbringing and, and, and the narrative of how everything else hung together. We laughed about it, we joked about it, but it was central to everything she did. Mm -hmm. in, in, in what ways did it, uh, does it shape your thinking today, particularly as you are in COP right now and, and, and having these discussions with leaders? Uh, how do you think about her legacy and, and where she would maybe have wanted to see the world go? Well, I think, first of all, I think she would be very proud to see the centrality of nature. Today we talk about nature-based solutions, we talk about the African restoration movement. This is what she was talking about many, many years ago. But I think the, the real, um, I guess, celebration would be the fact that we appreciate today that forests, for example, are our life support systems. We know that now quite f profoundly. We talk about the value of Africa's forests to the world. We talk about the fact that they're undervalued, the fact that we do not uh, take into consideration the biodiversity value, that these forests are more than just a cluster of standing trees. That, to me, was, is such an important part of why I continue to champion forests. And I continue to talk about the fact that the restoration movement may be the single most important movement in cushioning us especially as Africans, against the, the worst impacts of climate change. So around our local communities and just making sure that we have trees. We know now just how crucial that is. Yeah. Uh, just hearing you think, talk about that, um, both you and I live in Nairobi, uh, first developing, first urbanizing city, uh, major expressways and highways getting built and apartments where we, you know, we're seeing a lot of trees being cut. And, um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the tension that exists between your work in terms of preservation, in terms of reforesting, and the type of conversations that you're having with governments in t by saying, yes, we understand we need highways so that we can make these cities livable, but we also need to have the trees and have the, the nature and, and make sure that you know, the green spaces within the cities do not disappear. No, that's, that's, a, that's a big tension, especially in our part of the world, because the, the infrastructure that's needed for us is still being built. And so most people, a lot of people who come to Nairobi, Abdi, say, oh my goodness, I'm so surprised how green Nairobi is. Mm -hmm. And those of us who live there are crying every day, like, no, no, don't cut one more tree. But what, what is happening, actually, is, I think, uh, a lack of, of um, evidence, especially, for our leadership those in charge of city planning, just how crucial those trees are. That it, it, it matters if you cut a tree to plow a road through and then plant a seedling. You see that all the time. They'll plow down 3,000 trees and then they'll plant 3,000 seedlings. And that, that is really difficult. And so for, at least for organizations like ours, and there are many organizations now working on city issues around greening cities, it's to present the evidence that actually the, the, the mental health of our citizens. And COVID helped in this case, because when COVID happened, a lot of people retreated into green spaces. And so today we appreciate them a lot more than we did then. But that when, as we plan, we should plan around green infrastructure, because if you, if you cut them down, it's another generation to get back what you lost. And so it's in the planning, it's in the acknowledgement that actually walking around cities is, is really important to be able to bike around cities. I mean, you couldn't bike in Nairobi today, but that's not because we don't like biking. It's because it's, it's a death trap to bike. But if we had access, we would probably do that. A lot of people, Abdi, today will tell you that they are finding out they have asthma that is pollution related. That's because we have way too many cars floating in our, on our roads, and more and more roads being built. But we, are not, we don't have less traffic. We have a lot more traffic, as yeah. a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. I, at this COP, you've emphasized the need for a focus on climate adaptation. Can you talk about why adaptation is particularly important for Africa? Oh, my God, yeah. Adaptation is the most important thing. I just I share a story just because I think it, it's so... Um, demonstrates why adaptation is important. A, a good friend of mine is from the pastoralist community, and as you've written, Abdi, about the drought that is ravaging through our part of the world. And she comes from the Maasai community, and she's been rescuing girls from early marriage. 
these are girls eight to 12 years old. And as she's doing her work, she told me in this drought season, it's been hectic because they've been rescuing more and more girls. Why? Because for Maasai men, livestock are everything. This is their life. This is, as you know, their wealth. But I, what I hadn't quite appreciated is just how the dynamic plays out. And this is where the gender lens is so drastic. She told me she met uh, a little girl who was about to, be, to go out to be married. She was eight years old. Think about that, eight. And she had, she was not being forced. She had offered herself. Why? Because her father had said to her, he has nothing left. He has no wealth left. His entire herd has died in these floods, in, this, in these droughts. And as a result, he only had his staff, the, the shepherd's staff. And the little girl said, Daddy, I don't want you to, to be like this. It, it brings shame to the family. And so she offered herself out. I don't think any of us considered that dynamic and the impact that has. So the little girl will not go to school. She's going to be gone. But of course, Agnes rescued her, and she's now safe. But that is repeating itself over and over again. How many girls will miss out? If we do not build the capacity for communities, especially in vulnerable countries, to adapt against climate change, floods, droughts, why is it that you lose a hundred head of cattle? Where are the abattoirs? Where are the systems that would ensure that that man doesn't lose everything? and that his family feels compelled to intervene an eight-year-old child. So that, that to me is the bottom. That is the bottom. And we must, as we are here in, at, at COP, you just remember the fact that commitments were made to double adaptation finance. We're not there yet. We're doing poorly as, as a matter of fact. But that's what we are saying is okay when we don't invest in adaptation. You raise a very important point about the, the gender aspect of this, and, and particularly because women in many places in Africa, even in Kenya, um, they still have to walk very long distances to collect firewood, and then they come and, and sort of like are on the frontiers because, you know, they're staying in these small tukuls or like, you know, homes where, the, you know, the, the air pollution, you know, the, the, them and the children are. Could you talk a bit about um, how that environmental degradation particularly is intertwined with problems in food systems and is particularly impacting women? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, appreciating the fact that the, the systems, the water cycle, the, 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 the systems of, of agriculture, we largely are still a rain-fed agricultural country. So most of our agriculture depends on rainfall. And when rains fail like they have, so too does food production. We have less food. We have to go further and further for water. And then you also have to prioritize. Are you going to pour the water on the plants or drink it? So, of course, portable water takes priority. And you can very quickly see how this spirals out of control. But we also are neglecting the fact that for Kenya, for example, our five water towers are the lifeline of water. The minute we begin to interfere with those, waters, those water towers, we begin to interfere with our water systems. And so there is no um, cushioning. The rivers dry up much faster. They dry up even when it's not, even in the day, rainy season, you don't have. And what you have is too much water, which of course also uh, washes away the, the agricultural um, soils and of course the sea. So it, it is interfering basically with our ability to produce food. That's a problem in and of itself. And because we are rain-fed, and, and, and of course part of the adaptive capacity we have to build is about, is, is about irrigation. How do we, when we have a lot of water coming down, how do we harness that so that when we have water, we, we don't have too much, and then when we don't have water, we have none? It's, it's about that's part of the adapt, adaptation agenda. Let's talk a bit about solutions, and we'll open it to the audience in a minute. But you know, there's the question, you've also talked about the question of, of justice, and, and Africa is 
particularly responsible for just a sliver of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, how much support should come from the countries that are, you know, the ones that are emitting the most, uh, and, and, and how should they support African countries uh, in tackling some of these challenges? Well, I think, I think um, we have to remember the, the principle of, of equal but differentiated responsibility. And I, I completely subscribe to polluter pays. So we need to make sure that commitments that have been made by the, the big emitters, the rich, white, affluent uh, economies, pay uh, for the pollution that, we are, that we, are, we are experiencing. And so that, that is, of course, on the table here because there's a lot of discussion around attribution, and science has gotten a lot tighter on attribution. We do have to make, uh, be honest and have honest discussions about the fact that you do have to pay for the pollution, and that's what the Paris Agreement demands. Those are the agreements we've made. And that, it, absent that, we are stuck, because without finance, we cannot move on just about anything, including the energy transition, including adaptation, and in, of course, on loss and damage. I, I was just wondering how much you think that uh, Africans and African billionaires, and we talked a little bit before this about a philanthropist, uh, should be able to contribute to this. And is there a mechanism for them to even contribute or, or take the leadership in this? Well, I think that's growing. Uh, there's definitely the Africa Philanthropy Forum, which has done quite a bit in trying to rally African philanthropy. But African philanthropy is still very young. We haven't seen African philanthropy in times, except in times of dire need. You have a situation where things are really, really bad, and then Africa philanthropy rallies. But in terms of looking at some of, like adaptation, that's long term. That's looking at what could happen. It's not visible at the moment. And so we, we do not have a mature philanthropy culture in Africa that can be that can be rallied um, at the moment. Okay, we'll open up to the audience if there's a question. Hi, uh, I know you talked about that that story of, of the the girl you know choosing to sell herself, and that and how like social issues and climate issues are interlaced like throughout basically. All, all of all walks of life. Can you talk a bit more about how you work together with social, you know, activists, people who work against these issues, um, to kind of combat? Because you're all we're all working towards the same goal, but just talking about that intersection, that connecting connectedness between tackling social issues as well as climate issues, and that they're one in the same. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really important because social safety is is part of what's affected by, by the climate crisis. And, and we have, that's just one example. There are several examples where, especially if you looked at what happened during COVID, a lot of people who suffered were not actually the poorest of the poor. It was actually those who are in the informal economy who are invisible to social safety nets. They're invisible to the social system. And so they're not, when you're looking for people, you can't find those in the informal economy. They're not in any system. And so those were the most vulnerable and those are the most affected. You need social safety nets that actually reach everybody and reach those in particular. But if you, and, and the impacts of climate that are affecting people are affecting them wherever they are. So they're in cities, in rural areas, equally. And so we have to build that sort of support across the board. Other question? Hey, can we get a mic here? Sure, I love asking questions. <laughs> um, so before this session, you had this fabulous debate on, um, yeah, climate justice and um, decarbonization and whether we invest or the Global South invests in expanding the fossil fuel narrative and it was really an interesting debate, but I don't actually know where anyone stood on the issue. And so, as we discussed afterwards, so could you enlighten us? Like, what what is the role fossil fuel should or shouldn't have? Like, in the ideal narrative forward, what's the arc of you know getting off the fossil fuel crack diet? 
and really moving toward regenerative um, agriculture and um, renewable energy for Africa. Yeah. Well, the, the role of that debate was exactly that, right? Is to, to surface some of the complexities that this debate is eliciting. Uh, you know, here's the thing. We are often asking the wrong question. This is an issue that is extremely polarized. It's extremely misunderstood. And the truth is it, it requires a nuanced understanding of what's going on. Country by country, every country quite different. Take Kenya, for example. Kenya's grid, electrical grid, is largely renewable. Last year, 90% of Kenya's energy came from renewable sources. But we still have 70% of people who don't have access to electricity. How is that possible? Well, we are stuck in a vicious cycle of very expensive energy because the grid is limited. The grid is limited because the demand is so low. You heard me say, 5% of, of subscribers to the electrical grid provide 70% of the revenue. That is unsustainable. It is not a profitable business today to deliver electricity. Why? Because the cost of capital is so high. So until the cost of capital goes down, it's going to be very difficult. And, and of course, creating demand is also part of the industrialization agenda. You hear, I was talking about, Africa is solving for economic development. We need to eliminate poverty because the underlying driver of vulnerability on our continent is poverty, full stop, finished. If we don't resolve that issue, we will continue to live on the edge. And that's unacceptable. And so for anybody who is discussing this issue, you must understand what you're solving for. We're solving for economic development requires energy. Where will that energy come from? It depends on the options that you have. And every country will have a different nuanced analysis of the pathways available. For us, it will be based on the cost of capital. Today, at the current cost of capital, in most countries in Africa, 16 to 20%, believe it or not, that's at the cost of money in Kenya and other places. The most cost-effective energy source today is what? diesel engines, diesel generators. It's completely polluting and you would today say absolutely not, but that's what is incentivized at this cost of capital. The cost of capital in a country like yours, perhaps even in, in Switzerland, would of course incentivize solar and wind because they're very capital intensive upfront. So that's what we have to understand because we cannot suspend economic development Africa will go for whatever is available at the current cost of capital. So the real battle, the real battle is on reducing the cost of capital. We have to make sure that people can borrow at fair prices. And multi, you know, multilateral development banks should be doing more development than bank. Because at the moment, we are seeing a lot more risk-averse development um, agendas from them. We need to see, uh, they, they, it is a risky business. <laughs> well, let's face it, these are not fancy times. So we've got to make sure that they do more development and development actually means extending credit in, at much, much lower uh, rates, especially for development banks. Thank you for that uh, nuance answer. I have a question about uh, the role of women entrepreneur in Africa. You talked about how women are disproportionately impacted by these issues, but also the uh, entrepreneurship and the um, energy is, is, is phenomenal, uh, potential source of leadership. The issue is access to finance. They don't um, be able to you know, have the network or, or the necessarily yet the setup to be able to access finance. And I'm just wondering in your work what, what your perspectives on that are. Sorry, Sophie, I didn't hear the front part of that. So the, the question is, what do you, you think is needed to create a condition for women entrepreneurs to really de lead that sustainability agenda? Yeah, well, there's some real exciting opportunities. I happen to be fortunate to lead a network of women entrepreneurs in renewable energy. This was mainly in the clean cooking space. 
because that's one area actually where gas will have to be. I mean, I don't know. I, I would love a, 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 the next Oxford style debate should be around clean cooking and gas. It would be really important to, for us to acknowledge that women have to be involved across the value chain of clean cooking, both in the, the design and development of clean cooking technologies so that they fit and they're fit for purpose, but also in, in the use which they're predominantly engaged in. But entrepreneurship, small and medium enterprises, especially in that sector, are really exciting and growing. The, the, I, I talked about the Africa Restoration Movement. That's another area where women's engagement is crucial. Establishing tree-based businesses. Today we have a lot of women involved in tree-based businesses, whether they're growing commercial trees like macadamia nuts and others, or they're growing trees and providing planting material for the restoration movement. These are real opportunities that will create jobs for a largely young population. Remember, the average age of Africans today is 19 years old. So very young population looking and building clearly amazingly entrepreneurial opportunities. But there are clear opportunities in these businesses, for example. Bonjour, Malai. It's been an honor. Hello. Thank you so much. Wait, can I ask one more question? Thank you. Thank you. We're... OK. Time's up. We've run out of time. I'll answer it. Come. We have one very disappointed person who, who <laughs> wants to ask a question. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm going to shorten my remarks. I was going to say a few things, but I'm going to shorten because I want you to ask that question. And then, um, so go ahead. OK, so um, I think we can all agree, or mostly agree, that in order for Africa as a continent to transition or to develop clean and sustainable energies, there needs to be funding, and that needs to come from high-emitting countries and wealthier countries. So I guess my question is that as money continues to be the thing most talked about, but also most avoided, and as we can even see today, you know, it's very easy to dodge a question on money when there's a guilt factor involved and when there's not a clear answer. So I'm wondering what is realistic for holding these countries and these nations accountable, and what are the reasons that um, we aren't seeing them follow through? Like, is it just about developing more revenue, more profit, capitalism, or is there not enough money? I'm just kind of at a loss for how this happens over and over again. But. Yeah, no, great question, great question. It's a good one for us to finish on. There is more than enough money in this economy. Don't let anybody lie to you. It's plenty out there. When COVID happened and economies need to be shored up, 17 trillion showed up. There's money. We have a crisis in empathy. We are living in exceedingly unempathetic times. And that is a fact. I think if we were to be honest with ourselves, we would be in solidarity. Today, we don't acknowledge just how connected we are. If you look at today's supply chains across the board, the relationship between the beef industry in the US and the Amazon, the cosmetic industry in Europe and, and, and palm oil production, you look at mining in Africa and, and the, the technology industry, we are more connected than we acknowledge. We need to acknowledge that crisis in empathy. That's what's needed. And I think the youth movement is doing a lot better than most of us in waking up that sense of empathy in all of us. That it cannot be, it is going to be about finance, and don't be shy about saying it over and over again. Climate finance is the most important issue at this COP and going forward until it's delivered. Until it's delivered. But if we do not get over the fact that there's a, a, a crisis in how we see people of different colors, cultures, genders, and geographies, we're cheating ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. It is a crisis in empathy. Thank you.